Amen. You may be seated. Hey, can I remind you real quick how great it is, not an accomplishment unto ourselves, but to the Lord, praising his holy name. Do you know there are churches that I've done revivals in where their baptistries were storagey, um, where they haven't used them in so long that they just started piling things in them? The fact that God has been moving in a way like that to see people obedient, I, don't, I hope we do not take that for granted, what God is doing, but cherish every last step of obedience that, that God does. We were talking about it in our class today, so easy to become almost negative in life, but, but to sit there and realize what God is doing and, and check the praises of it. Man, what an awesome God we serve. Amen. We are in Matthew chapter 5, and I, I like to preach verse by verse through the Bible. Um, I, the way the Lord leads me and prompts me, and it was a challenge to me um, because I used to be pretty topical, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but I realized one time that I, I would preach or not preach based on circumstances that were going on in the church. If people were hurting, uh, if there was divorce, if there were situations that were going on, I found myself avoiding those passages, and the Lord really convicted me. Either the Bible is for all or it's not. And the Lord had to really speak to me about that, his word. And so I preach verse by verse through there. We are in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, unless the Lord ever prompts me to, to get off course, which he does from time to time. Uh, but I try to stay as faithful to the scripture as can be. Here's what's going on. It is the Sermon on the Mount. Crowds have gathered around Jesus. He sits down on the side of a hill. He begins to start speaking. His disciples sit closest to him. They're at his feet. They're listening to what he has to say. Crowds of people are gathering around. Now, within the crowds, there are those that have heard of things that he's done and miraculous works. There's those that have heard of his teachings and the power that's going on with him. There are those that have, have heard about some of the, the persecution that's already starting to rise up and the anger that the Pharisees and the the scribes and the Sadducees have against them. And, and you could even imagine some of those gathering around on the outside wanting to see, is he a rebel or is he something that is holy? All these crowds of people gathered together to hear Jesus start teaching. And he starts teaching by the Beatitudes. And we remember it said, blessed are. And what that meant was happy are. And as you go through the happiness of the testimonies, and he starts giving the rewards back and saying, here's what's going to happen to him. He gets to a point where he starts talking about persecution. And he starts saying to those, those who are persecuted are blessed. Like happy are those who are persecuted. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are those when they insult and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of my name. That doesn't sound like something that is happy, right? Happy are you when they come against you. Then he gets and he switches it and he starts telling them what we talked about last week. You are the salt of the earth. If salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And he starts challenging the people. And what he is saying is, when the persecution comes, when the struggles come, when they grab you, when they are ready to kill you for your faith, remember, you're salt of the earth. You are the light on the hill. Do not cave. And we saw four this morning that stands up. And says, I want to follow the Lord. I do not want to cave. Now he gets into this next part. And he starts talking about the law. So here's how I see it. You can see him challenging the general teaching of the Beatitudes. Then he gets into the challenging when they persecute him. And, and then you get into the idea of the salt in the earth and challenging the people to stay faithful. And you can almost start hearing rumors amongst the crowd, the Pharisees and the scribes sitting there looking at him and thinking about his teaching. And maybe they start rumbling, is this the, the Messiah or is this a false teacher trying to lead people astray? So... Jesus starts speaking on it as if it's the announcement of his ministry. He says this. Do not assume that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you, until heaven and earth will pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore... Whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Imagine the scribes and the Pharisees sitting back there and saying, that's right. Look at how holy and righteous we are. It is this idea, this pompous relatedness, this idea that their faith is so much greater than everybody else. And Jesus almost fans that. He was like, of course, unless your righteousness passes those of them, you'll never enter in. But what they don't remember is going back to the beginning. He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Man, when I say I was an ornery kid, I'm not kidding. Like, Guys, this is no joke. I got swats every year from kindergarten to my senior year in high school. I had a teacher one time that was like, I was sure I was going to get through school and never give a swat. You challenged that. I I was about as bad as you could get without doing violent crime. I I was terrible. And to know that Jesus Christ loves me, there was never going to be. Have you you ever read Leviticus and you start looking through all the laws and the things in place that that you have to do to try to to work or attain righteousness and the things that you have to do? Guys, I'm going to tell you, there wasn't enough kitty cats in the world for me to sacrifice to ever. Like at all. Like all all the animals. Like I couldn't have done it. There, There wasn't enough. But Jesus loves me. And somewhere along the way, I found out what grace and forgiveness is. And I have to remember that from time to time. That he loves me, regardless of mistakes or hurts or sinfulness, that he loves us. And that he came to give us everlasting life. Now, I'm going to explain that a little further later. But I want to go through this. This is what the message is. What Jesus did and did not come to do. Are you ready for this? This is what Jesus did not come to do. He did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. Imagine those Pharisees looking around there, wanting to challenge him on his teachings, waiting for him to mess up. What he was speaking about before wasn't about the law. They were wanting to challenge him. This is what they held their hat on. This is what they were so passionate about was the laws and making sure they did all the things right. And Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. You know, if you were to look at the laws in the Old Testament of what they had to have, did you know there were 613 laws to be obedient to? 613. I bet some of you guys sped on the way to church today, didn't you? Maybe you ran a red light coming to church, you heathens. 613 that they had to follow. There was the moral law, there was the judicial or civil law, there was the ceremonial law that they had to follow. You know what the moral law is, don't you? How about this? Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Do not have any other gods beside me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens or above or on earth below or in the waters under the earth. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for their father's sins. By the way, I think about that a lot of time, my poor kids. To the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You're not to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day of the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the foreigner who is within your gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blesses the Sabbath day and declared it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord God is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. His maid or his female slave, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to the neighbor. (sighs) They're waiting. Are you going to challenge the moral law? This is what we hang it all on. 
You going to challenge us? Do you know how serious some of them take it? In 1992, in Israel, there was a fire that broke out in a house on a Sabbath. And in this apartment, this house that the fire broke out, the people were so worried that if they picked up the phone and they called for help, that it not only would break the circuit of the phone, that it would challenge work, that it would also get the firefighters to have to come and work on the Sabbath. And so they were so confused about it that they seek out their rabbi to ask questions. Is it okay for us to call for help and fire department to come and put out the fire on the Sabbath or is it not? And the the rabbi and the the people, they started conferring and talking about it and debating and, and talking about it. By the time they were done, three apartments had burned down. This is how serious people would take this. And This during this time was even that much more so when he talks about the rabbis and the Pharisees, the scribes talking about how how holding on to the law it was and your righteousness will not pass them. They would sit there and think that they are doing everything they possibly could right. They would work for their salvation. They followed the moral law. There was the civil law. This, This was the rules that governed the nation of Israel. It covered like conflict. It covered dress, like how you were supposed to dress. It covered diet. Man, you ever read Leviticus and you look at the diet in there? You praise God for Jesus Christ. Amen? Man, no shellfish, no pork. No pork? That's like no happiness. You know what I mean? And they can't eat all of this stuff and and, and the rules and the regulations that go with it. Man, it is tough. It is hard. Covered those things. It covered cleanliness like how you were supposed to take care of yourself in the cleanly process, and I don't want to get into all of it. Matter of fact, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. When it comes to disputes, how about this one? Leviticus 19.18. Do not take revenge or bear a grudge against members of a community, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. This was like a foremost thing. It's like when you get ready to handle disputes, don't hold the grudge. Try to do this. Let's handle it right. What about this cleanliness? Leviticus 13.2. When a person has a swelling scab or spot of the skin of his body, that means leprosy is what he's getting at, and it becomes a disease on the skin of his body, he's to be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. The priest will examine the infection on the side of his body, or the skin of his body. If the hair in the infection has turned white and the affection has appeared deeper than the skin of his body, it's a skin disease. And after the priest examines him, he must pronounce him unclean. You know what would happen? If you had skin rashes, if you had uh, anything that would go on, if you were not deemed clean, if you could not get it taken care of, this is what you'd have to do. You'd have to go to the outside of town. You'd have to live on the outside of town. You'd have to keep your hair unshaven, your beard in disarray. You would have to walk around and look at the people, and you would raise your hand if people came near you. You'd have to warn them and say, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. You would have to leave your wife. You'd have to leave your children. You'd have to leave your friends. You would be isolated on the outside. Modern day, what it came to was Hansen's disease is where we get leprosy from. And you know what they would do in leper colonies when they would study them? They would do tests on them. They would run tests to see and try to understand leprosy and how bad it was. Here's what they would do. They would take the keys to apartments of some of these lepers, and they would grab the keys, and they would throw them into fire, and they would make them go reach in there and get them. And get this, lepers would reach into the fire, and they could grab their keys and pull them off, and the skin would be rotting and melting off their skin, and they could hold on to their keys with just their bones. Could you imagine that? I had these spots pop up on my, my body. I've got one right here right now, and uh, they popped up all over the place. And, and uh, when I was a teenager, and I was so nervous to go bring it up, I didn't know what it was. And I, I went and uh, talked to the doctor about it one day, and they said uh, it was psoriasis. Does any of you have psoriasis? And they said, it's psoriasis. It's, it's a skin disease. And, and I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, it's like a minor form of leprosy. I just knew it. I was going to be walking around Walmart. I'm unclean. (laughs) I'm unclean. Right? No. No. You you go through this and you just think about how lonely that would have been. Because Israel was supposed to 
try to walk this perfect life to be an example to everybody, to, to strive to this holiness for the nations to see. But they were only going to fail over and over and over again. But don't think that the Lord didn't know that. That's why Jesus, whenever he's talking about it, he says he didn't come to destroy the prophets. There were so many prophecies that were in place over him and what was to come. And and, and did you know there's prophecies about his birth? There's prophecies about where he's going to be born. There's prophecies about the time he's going to be born. There's prophecies about the life he's going to live. There's prophecies about the death that he's going to have. There are so many of them. Matter of fact, it is said that with all the prophecies that come to be, it's something like 450. 56 prophecies concerning Jesus that were fulfilled. Do you think about that? All these prophecies were in place. Because they weren't going to be good enough. And they were going to need the Savior. They even had the ceremonial law that was so important to them. Leviticus 19.30 says, You keep the Sabbath and revere my sanctuary, I am Yahweh. Have you ever looked at all the rules that go with their ceremonies and what they were supposed to do? There was so much that came in the fashion of of preparing sacrifices and what they had to take place. There was offerings and what they had to do. There were sacrifices that had to be. There were so many preparations that had to go in to trying to remove the sins from that of Israel, only for them to fall once again. And they would do it again, and the process kept going on, over and over and over again, never once to totally be good enough. But yet, those Pharisees and their scribes would teach if you just kept following them, you would be good enough. And Jesus looks to confirm it. He says, I tell you your righteousness until it surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees. You'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. He even goes further here in a little bit. We won't get into it this week, but he gets further whenever he starts talking about murder and he starts talking about uh, adultery and he's using the moral law with it. And he said, have you ever committed murder? Essentially, do not commit murder. You've heard it said, do not commit murder. But if you have hatred in your heart towards your brothers, you're guilty of murder. Like how many of you have ever said, I hate you to a brother? And it gets into the idea of adultery. If you look with lust in your heart. Every billboard out there seems like this is what they're selling to us all the time. I I can tell you right now, guilty. You look at all of this and we fall. We're not good enough. And he's saying, unless you surpass that of the scribes and the Pharisees, what he's even doing is putting that much more on it, saying, you're never going to be there, ever, on your own. Because this is what Jesus did come to do. He came to be fulfillment. He didn't destroy the law. He filled it. Don't assume I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but to fulfill. I assure you until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter would pass from the law until all things are accomplished. Galatians 3.22 or 3.21 shows us that he is the accomplishment of the moral law. Look at this. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would certainly be the law. But the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise of faith by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was the guardian unto Christ, or the schoolmaster unto Christ, the disciplinarian under to Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. You go back and you read those Ten Commandments. How many of those have you broken? Let's let's, let's just let's just throw it out. I like to do this from time to time. How about we'll go simple. How many of you have ever not honored your father and mother? Raise your hand. (sighs) A lot of you, right? Um, We'll go um, lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Raise your hand. You liars. You're doing it right now. (laughs) What what about what about this? 
How many of you have ever stolen anything? Remember, you just said you're a bunch of liars. Be honest with me. How many of you have ever stolen anything? Yeah. All right. So I'm in here with some crazy heathens, right? Dishonorable, liars, yeah, those that have stolen. How about, how about this? You don't have to raise your hand. Just be honest with me. How many of you have ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Now you think about this. You go through all of it. Are you ever going to be good enough on your own? How many times are you justified by it? It would be like taking my, my pickup that, that's out there, and you take it, and, and you go, and you feed the homeless out of it, and one day you get pulled over. Does the police officers care that you fed the homeless out of this pickup? No. What they care about is that you stole the vehicle. It doesn't matter how long it is. It is a consequence of what happens. It doesn't matter the good that you did. You're never going to undo the fact you broke the law. And here it is. The law has been broken. We broke it. All people have broken it. The moral law, it has been broken. But Jesus is the schoolmaster. The law is the schoolmaster that brings us to him. What it's supposed to do is to show us we're not good enough. I can't be good enough. I've broken all the rules, the statutes, the commitments. I'm never going to be good enough. My righteousness will never, ever surpass that of the Pharisees and scribes. I can't do it. God says, I know. I know. So what this law should do should be to open your eyes to realize you can't do it on your own. You need Jesus to come and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He fulfilled the moral law. He fulfilled even the civil law. It, was, it wasn't about how they regulated themselves and the, the, the battering of one another and how they handled everything, disputes and cleanliness. You remember the disputes? Don't take revenge or bear a grudge against the members of your community, but love your neighbor as a self of mine, Yahweh. This is what Jesus says, talking about this. In John 13, 34, I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. But you must also love one another by this. All people will know you are my disciples if you love for one another. I had a guy, I was talking about this one time, and it said, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. And this guy made this point. He said, that's easy for me to do. I hate myself. And he was being serious. I hate myself. Oh, I can love my neighbors because I love myself. I despise myself, okay? So Jesus knew that was going to be said. You know what he said? A new commandment I give you. Love as I have loved you. That's hard. That's tough. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the very people that were crucifying them on the cross. love them. You start talking about that kind of love, boy, it challenges you. Matthew 8, 2. Right away, a man with a serious skin disease came up and he knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, he touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately the disease was healed. Then Jesus told him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift of Moses prescribed as a testimony to them. He would take those with this skin disease that is so horrible. I want you to think about it. You think about being so isolated and having to tell everybody you're so unclean. You think about the leprosy. You think about the skin rotting off of you. You think about the cartilage in your nose and your ears falling off of you. You think of how repulsive you probably looked. Think of how repulsive you probably smelled. Think about being totally isolated with nobody able to touch you. And then one day, Jesus comes to you and he heals you. Your body completely made whole again. Do you think that you would absolutely love him and devote yourself to him? Do you think that it would be more than just having your skin healed, that you could feel the touch of someone else again, a hug from someone else again, somebody to come say they love you and touch you and kiss you once again? He fulfilled it. 
He made it whole. He made it perfect. He, he showed this guy that he would take them all and he would, he would handle them. And he even said, go show the priest what happened to you. Go show them that it can be the testimony of what took place. I can bring healing. He was the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. You, you take the very holy of the holies. You take the very sanctuary where they had to go. And when he died on the cross, it was ripped from top to bottom, the veil from top to bottom. And all of a sudden, anybody with faith in the Lord could go straight to him because Jesus was the mediator between us and God. And he did that for us. You could think about all the things that had to be no longer a need for a priest. We don't have to go confess our sins to a man in a little brown box. We get to talk to one another. Confess our sins one to another. We get to lift them up to the Lord and he hears them from us. Sacrifices, he was the sacrifice. I always think it's funny how Jesus came, or when the announcement of Jesus came, the first people the angels went to, do you remember who it was whenever he was born? The shepherds in the field. Do you know what those shepherds in the field, what their job was to do? To raise the lambs in Bethlehem that would go off to Jerusalem, that would be bought for slaughter for the sacrifices of the people. I love the fact that the Lord appeared to them first as if to almost say, you're out of a job. Because I'm raising the one pure lamb who's going to be the sacrifice for them all. He was the fulfillment of it all. He was the fulfillment of the prophets. He didn't come to destroy the prophets' teachings. He was the answer to them. Of all the things that talked about, whether it be the coming Messiah and the birth of them, or, or what he was going to do when he comes next. And, and we can argue about it. We can say that you're a pre-tribulationist, or you're a mid-tribulationist, or you're a post-tribulationist. You can be a, a premillennialist and all millennials. You, you could hold to all these different ideas. Do you know what it is in reality? You're a pantheist. It means this. It's all going to pan out. In the end, however he says it's going to be, however he chooses to do it, I'm a pre-tribulationist. If Jesus comes back in the middle of a tri uh, tribulation and I go to heaven, he's not going to say, you're not welcome because you believed in the pre-tribulation. <laughs> he's the answer to it. Do you know why it's so ambiguous? Because he doesn't want you to know all the answers yet. Keep studying. He'll show it. He'll reveal himself. He gives all of that to us. I love the idea of the birth being fulfilled exactly where it was to take place. Death, exactly how it was supposed to be. Salvation, exactly how it was going to be. Do you even realize that in the first three chapters of Genesis, in the third chapter, you get the idea of the prophecy of Jesus coming about how woman was going to bear a child that was going to crush the serpent under his foot. Jesus did that. All of it was pointing to him. He was the fulfillment of the prophets. He's sitting there saying, I did not come to destroy these things. I came to a fulfill them. I came for all of this. And when Jesus made the announcement that this is what he came to do, he was trying to show them all, you will never be able to pass the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes by staying burdened under this. You've got to wait till I fulfill it all. <laughs> you look at those kiddos that come up here. Sweet kiddos, kind kiddos. They, they love, they, they joke around. Can I tell you something? They're ornery, sinful kids, too. <laughs> A daddy, amen, yes. I know it. I say it all the time. You could go sit there and take three kids, put them back in the nursery, give two toys, and sit back and watch the Thunderdome begin. It's like a UFC fight in there. Now, who taught them that? Who taught them how to fight for toys? You know how it is? They're sinful by nature. This is what they do. They, they battle with one another. They struggle. They covet. They want. They desire. They are selfish in their nature. But one day, one day we pray that they realize the depths of their sinfulness and how much Jesus loved them. Pay the price for their sinfulness. To die so that they could be found righteous 
that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes is fulfilled by the blood of the Lamb. Man. Um, Josh, I won't tell any of the stories of, of the things you talked about the other day, but when you came back to the back and you were sharing why you needed to be baptized and what God was doing, and you were broken and you were crying, and I was just sitting there looking going, man, Jesus loves you. <laughs> and I think about how on me and how terrible I was. How Jesus loves me. I, I remember one of the guys that gave me swats in high school. He saw me later on at a, at a Franklin Graham crusade. And I was a counselor and he was a counselor. And he was like, I thought for sure you'd be in prison. And then I punched him. No. <laughs> no. I get it. But Jesus loved me. And he loves you. And he pays the price. I use that illustration a lot of times about my pickup and about if people steal it and they go feed the homeless out of it and they, they go and they take them for years. Go feed them. And one day they get pulled over and the police look at it and say, this is a stolen vehicle. And you say, yes, but I fed the homeless out of this vehicle. I took care of them. They're, they're not going to care at all. They arrest you and they take you to jail. And let's just say that it goes back to the old Texas laws, the horse thief law. You remember that? The idea that if they stole the horse, the means of transportation, do you remember what the punishment was? Death. Yeah, hanging. And let's just say it goes back to that law and they're like, well, you stole the mode of transportation. Here's the punishment, death. And you try to argue in front of the judge. But judge, wait, wait, I, I did all these good things. He doesn't care. The law was broken. And all of a sudden, I come busting in the door and I say, wait, wait, wait. Wait. Let me die for them. And the judge looks at me, wait, wait. Who are you? It was my vehicle. My vehicle was the one that's stolen. Please, I understand the law says death is the punishment. This is what has to happen. Can I please die on his behalf? Judge looked at you. Why would you want to die on his behalf? Because I love him. Why do you love somebody that would steal your vehicle, your mode of operation, your transportation? Why would you love somebody like that? I just do. <laughs> I just do. And the judge says, you're willing to die even though they stole your vehicle? Yeah. And let's say the judge agrees to it and they take me and they hang me so that you could go free. Would I be a hero to you? The punishment for the violation of the law was death. The wages of sin But yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'll take your punishment. And he gets up on the cross and he pays the price for everything we ever did. And that blood washed us clean when we confess him as Lord and Savior of our life. It washes us clean and we surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes knowing that we can never be good enough but we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, if there is anybody here today that is not forgiven by the blood of the Lamb, if they have never called out to you to save their soul, to wash their sins clean, God, I pray you speak to them now. Convict them to draw close to you. For those that are here, we should be praising your holy name. We're not bound under the restrictions that were there. We, we don't, even though the moral law is still the moral law, we're not bound that every time we fall, we stumble, we trip, that we are doomed for an eternity in hell. No, we have grace that you gave us. Lord, <laughs> I'm going to go home today. And I'm going to have a pork loin sandwich. 
I can do that because of the fulfillment that you did. Lord God, you made that that was unclean, clean. And I can't say thank you enough because I'm a living example of it. So Lord, for those that are here that they need you as Savior, let them run forward to confess you. For those that are here that that they know you, but they've never followed through with baptisms. It's not washing away sins. The sin has been forgiven. Lord, show them that it's obedience and walking in you. Lord, for those that are here, that they trust in you. Lord, I pray during this time of invitation, they sing like the redeemed, praising your holy name. Maybe for some, it's to be a part of this church family and they come forward. Maybe it's for others to fall down and say, I trust in you, Lord, and I have faith in what you're going to do. I give everything to you, then do that. Whatever you have, this is our time of invitation, Lord. Speak to us that we would respond in faithfulness to whatever you call us to do. Lord, we're here to surrender. Draw us to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.